So I, I hope in the next hour that we'll be able to find out a little bit more about the Shinar trade in northern Ghana. And the title of this paper, which is I'm just about to submit to, I think, Development and Change. Um, I've just got a review back from Carol Colfer, which has been very helpful with some suggestions. Um, and the paper is entitled Globalizations in a Nutshell, the Shia Trade in Northern Ghana. And my co-author is Niels Fall, who's still based at uh, what used to be known as the Institute of Geography at the University of Copenhagen, and which has now become part of the phagocyted University of Life Sciences, which encompasses all sorts of bits and pieces, including the old university. So, in terms of an outline, I hope to give you a little bit of a historical context, a bit more basic information about the shear nut, the theoretical context that this paper tries to contribute to, and then I'll try and give you an overview of the colonial efforts to try and incorporate the northern territories of the Gold Coast colony, as it was then called, into the global economy, and then the late colonial efforts, and then how this differs from post-independence efforts to try and develop the shear nut trade. And then, before some concluding remarks, I'll try and just provide some <coughs> remarks about trying to compare these two <coughs> recent waves of globalization. If you know the work of Tony Hopkins, amongst others, we are currently in the fourth wave of globalization. Something that's frequently forgotten when we talk about globalization as if this is a contemporary phenomenon. Ghana, as we know it, today was in fact administered as three separate colonies. The Gold Coast colony, per se, a shanty colony, and then a protectorate of the northern terrace of the Gold Coast colony, in, which was established in 1901. And in terms of the colonial context, I borrowed this phrase of pain for hegemony on a shoestring from a wonderful American scholar called Sarah Berry. Um, who characterized much of British indirect rule as being hegemony on a shoestring. And uh, the British invested very little, in particularly their parts of empire that didn't actually have much to offer to help pay for colonial administration. And part of the question that I was trying to answer in this particular part of the world was to understand why the empire forestry mix, which had been successfully developed in India, and then exported all around the world, including to Australia, Malaysia, the US, and most Anglophone countries in Africa, was also introduced in this part of Ghana, where there were no timber resources. And the empire forestry mix, in, this, in essence, if, uh, if you know the work by Gregory Barton and others, was predicated on the notion of the colonial state appropriating large areas of land to set up forest reserves using the notion of scientific forestry to try and improve the management of these forests on the assumption that local people didn't know how to manage the forests. And thirdly, to extract the maximum revenues possible by exploiting timber to help pay for colonial administration. And the British did this very successfully both in Burma and in India and then exported this model all around the world. In this particular part of the British Empire, the Northern Territories, there were several attempts to try and substitute timber with other export crops, notably shear, the livestock, which had always been for centuries an important trade, north-south, and silk on. None of them worked, and I'll go on to explain the particular failures of the shear nut in particular. One of the reasons for this was that this particular area of Ghana, as we know it today, most male labor was extracted to set up police departments and other uh, law enforcement agencies, particularly in the southern parts of Ghana. And this had a profound impact on local economies in northern Ghana, and I'll come on to talk about this. But in general, this particular colonial backwater was distinguished by British parsimony and a complete lack of vision in terms of what was done to invest in it or not invest in it. And this has resulted in systematic underdevelopment, which continues to differentiate fundamentally between northern Ghana and southern Ghana, where most of the investment took place. To give you some example, several Ghanaian scholars were doing their PhDs at Edinburgh University in the 1850s, having been part of a broader 
uh, tradition in West Africa along the coast of long established schools and uh, tertiary education overseas built on local wealth and chiefdoms. It wasn't until 1957 that the first undergraduate came out of any part of the Northern Territories of Ghana. And if you add then all the other indicators of welfare, um, social health, uh, anything, there are fundamental differences which continue to underpin the differences between Northern and Southern Ghana. Some of you may know the body shop and may even have bought Shina oil. Uh, it's now, in terms of global trade, something like 10% of the global trade in Shia goes into the cosmetics industry. But this particular part of Ghana, in terms of where it occurs, particularly in the Sudan of Savanian zone in the north, is distinguished by a home and wage subsistence economy. And you might know the work, the seminal work by Joe Cordell and Gregory on the cyclic migratory patterns which have underpinned um, the economy in northern Ghana. During the dry season, most male labor, reinforcing colonial patterns of extraction of male labor, has continued to migrate south in search of seasonal work. This has become, in some cases, more permanent. It's a savanna part and crop. Botanically, it's a droop. And most of it is actually private property belonging to the clan lineages. Many of the ethnic groups in this part of northern Ghana share similar characteristics with other ethnic groups in what is present day Burkina Faso, what was then Urgolta. And these are acephalous clan lineages. They don't have chiefs in the traditional sense, and they have quite distinct land tenure chiefs, which are distinct from political chiefs. And this influences rights of access and rights of use of shear nut trees and other economically important trees on land, which are quite distinct from the rights to land. And the historical evidence that I've collected for this paper from 24 different centers of archives, both Francophone and Anglophone, indicate, based on the written evidence I've collected, that over the last 210 years, at least, this has been a gendered value chain controlled almost exclusively by women, both in terms of the collection of the shear nuts, but the processing of the shear nuts, and the marketing of the shear nuts. And again, in terms of published literature in the annals of the Association of American Job Geographers, there's a paper based on research done in Mali on the Shia nut trade. It represents more than half of household incomes for women. And this is critical in terms of the extent to which women can actually control these incomes. In addition, in terms of daily use, it's used in producing edible oils, soaps, and skin cares. And in some cases, increasingly, it's being mixed with other oils, such as oil palm, for local manufacture of soaps. Um, to compete with some of the more internationally traded soaps. In terms of the distinctions which the paper explores between the global and the local, which tends to polarize and ignore the fact there's a huge middle ground in terms of regional, I use the historical evidence to unpack and explore the difference between intra-regional trade based on long historically embedded patterns of periodic markets. Some of you may know the work of Claude Melissou, famous French scholar who in the 70s did a lot of work on periodic markets. These are markets which occur every three, four, five days all over West Africa with very strong gendered influence in terms of the role women play in controlling these nut markets. And in this particular case, particularly the petty trade in both nuts and sheer butter, but where there is some specialization which has emerged over time and which essentially use the opportunities created because of temporal supply variations. And as you'll go on to hear, the colonial rule created also new opportunities by creating an artificial boundary between English and French colonies. But in addition, there is the very important inter-regional trade based on particularly the smaller urban centers which provide the networks that then link with the major consumption centers all along the West African littoral. The large consumption centers such as in Accra, but all along the West African coast. And these are based on wholesales in food, particularly in the border zone areas, but pre predominantly in the marketing of cosmetics. It's a skin rehydrant um, for the south and the cities along the south. In terms of the theoretical context, the paper tries to contribute as a corrective to much of the published literature on global 
commodity change, in terms of adding a longer term historical perspective and a livelihood perspective. Very often, in some of the global uh, commodity chain work, globalization is often assumed to be a more reliable alternative or a superior alternative to reliance on local domestic, local or domestic regional markets. And very often food security, local social ecological systems are therefore relegated to being inferior to those which are presented in terms of globalized opportunities. So it's trying to challenge many of those assumptions. In addition, it's a specific corrective to Ghanaian historiography by actually seeing women as agents of change um, in terms of Ghana's history, and more specifically, the comparative neglect of any scholarly work that's been done with reference to the northern region in Ghana. So that's basically the background to the paper, and now I hope to give you a short overview of some of the colonial and post-independence efforts of how this part of northern Ghana was, attempts were made to incorporate it into the global economy. During the period between 1895, when the first envoys, a fancy official, were sent by the British colonial government to try and negotiate what were then called treaties of friendship and trade with the African chiefs as a basis of trying to secure commodities. And here I need to under underline one point. Frequently you hear about the scramble for Africa in terms of territory between the French, British, and Germans after the post-1885 Berlin Conference. But there was, as I discovered, and this was purely by accident, I stumbled on some of these very well-kept archives, there was also a scramble for commodities, and Shia was one of these commodities. So during the period between 1895 and the sort of 1920s, the British, on this border zone between what had been newly created as the Northern Territories and what was still then the Deuxième Territoire Paramilitaire, the second paramilitary territory of the French Government General de l'Afrique Occidentale Française, they tried to introduce border posts to try and control the movement of the Shia button and the Shia trade across this new boundary separating French from British colonial trade. And this was as a way of trying to tax the trade in this commodity to help pay for the local administration. What local traders, nearly all women did, was simply if the tax post was established here, they simply moved further down and then crossed the border anyway. It was completely ineffective as a way of either generating taxes or in terms of trying to control the tape. During that period, there were very few efforts to try and develop exports because of the problems of storing, of extracting the uh, butter, uh, and the difficulties of transporting it from an area in northern Ghana, where, lest we forget, it wasn't until the 1920s that road transport was first introduced into this part of Ghana. Previous trade was based very much on the old Volta river canoe system, which carried north certain commodities and came south with others. And lorry-based transport didn't really develop until after the Great Depression in the 1930s. Subsequently, during the period between the 1920s and the Great Depression in the 1930s, the colonial government tried to look at the possibilities of territorial integration. And here there were parallel similarities with what the British were trying to do in Nigeria, and where they actually followed up on their promise of building a railway linking northern Nigeria with southern Nigeria. There were similar plans in Ghana, but they never came to fruition. And again, based on an analysis of many of the appropriations of the British colonial government, there were significantly larger resources invested by the British colonial government in Nigeria than were ever invested in Ghana. It's a similar pattern if you compare Kenya and Tanzania and East Africa. So the railway to try and help improve transport from northern Ghana to the south was never built. But during this period, they also looked at other ways of trying to improve the production of the Shina. And this was looking at ways to try and protect the resource against what were perceived as the dangers and the threat of fire, characterized in that period as one of the three great evils, um, and trying to develop new plantations with what was a difficult and recalcitrant seed, but with very, very little success. In addition, there were efforts to try and improve both with chemicals and with mechanical improvements the extraction of the shear butter to improve the efficiency of extraction in relation to local extraction methods. But again, none of these had any significant impacts. 
And already by the 1930s, um, these efforts were almost abandoned up until the end of the Second World War. The official reasons advanced in the colonial government's records were the difficulties of transport, the uncertainties of supply, um, the demand for shea butter in the end markets in metropolitan Europe, I mean France and uh, Britain particularly, and there were new priorities as cocoa particularly became the new source of financing for British colonial administration. Then, of course, World War II happened in 1939, and Ghana, in effect, became a timber supply and non-timber forest product supply country for the British and American forces during World War II. And there's some fascinating work, which I hope to write up later, about the extent to which the country between 1939 and 1945 became a major supplier of tropical timber and many other non-timber forest products during that period. Post-World War II, there were some new initiatives which were largely fueled by a new act called the Colonial Development and Welfare Act, which was promulgated, I think, in the British Parliament in 1942, and which led to the approval of some new large grants to try and look at the development of not shea butter, but groundnuts. And this was largely because in the post-Second World War era, you may know from your own knowledge of history, much of Europe had suffered major supply cuts in vegetable oil, and there was a huge drive to try and improve the production and supply of vegetable oils for Europe in that immediate post-Second World War era. And many of you may have heard or know about the now infamous groundnut scheme in Rambo districts and in Tanzania, which actually secured a much larger grant. What is less well known is the Ganja Development Company. But in 1951, the British government approved a one million pound grants to develop the Gonja Development Company and employed 36 expatriates to provide, the, in the inverted commas, technical advice to help develop the cultivation of groundnuts, and which involved quite significant involuntary resettlement of many of the Ghanaians from a, what was perceived to be a densely populated area in northeast Ghana to settle in this area. Only three families remain. And the scheme, after three years, was abandoned again as a complete and utter fiasco of a state-led and centralized attempt to try and dictate how local communities produce and with little understanding of existing production systems. Already in terms of the science, there were some new interesting developments also in this late colonial period. As the basic ground-laying science of the understanding of cocoa butter on what has become a new science and a new industry, what are called cocoa butter equivalents, was also starting to take shape. And we'll come on to talk about this. Why this is important is that the cocoa butter equivalents are in effect very similar to cocoa butter, have in some cases even better qualities, uh, which are of interest to particular vested interest groups. And as you'll come on to hear, particularly in terms of now 90% of the trade in shea butter is linked to the world's chocolate industry. And this is where this became, in later years, particularly important. So there has been a shift away in terms of the end use values from edible oil to cocoa butter equivalents. And now what we see is that demand is very much dependent on what the world market price of cocoa, the very strong link between cocoa and cocoa, cocoa butter equivalents. And shea is probably the best example of a cocoa butter equivalent. And post-1997, as I'll come on to explain, this has led to a significant restructuring of the global value chain. But before we get there, in the period after independence in Ghana, there were several attempts to try and develop the Shia nut value chain, but based on very different premises to those in the colonial period. Shia became essentially forgotten up until the 1970s. And in the period of the 1980s, there were some initial efforts by the government of Ghana to introduce what were called export-led growth potentials of some of the minor crops that were known in Ghana, but which had never really been developed for export. Shea was one of these. And really, only in the post-1991 era did they start to introduce some form of public state-led regulation, licensing exports by marketing boards, or piggybacking on the cocoa marketing boards, but also looking at the potential of developing Shear butter. And this led to direct interventions by state structures in terms of the supply chain, in helping setting up cooperatives, 
influencing the formerly women-controlled patterns of harvesting, buying, storing, and selling, and the emergence of a new class of local traders. And this provided the, uh, the sort of foundations for the subsequent emergence of the larger um, middlemen traders with the emphasis on men who, in effect, substituted the women who formerly controlled this money chain. In the post-1991 era, structural adjustment, liberalization, private regulation, we've seen a consolidation of some of these actors, upgrading in terms of local processing opportunities, and the emergence of initially four global players, which have since been reduced to only three. Unilever, the Danish company Aosolia, and the Swedish company Karlsson have fused into a single company, and the Japanese company Fujioa. Those three companies now control that 90% of global trade, basically in terms of transforming the shea butter into cocoa butter equivalents to supply to the world's chocolate industry. The smaller part are the niche markets, such as the body shop in Anglophone countries, and Oxyten, which is a French company based in Provence, near, near where I, my home base is, who work in the Francophone countries. And there's a very strong split between the Anglophone and the Francophone in terms of the sourcing and marketing of these products. This is just a schematic to compare the differences in terms of the global com uh, commodity chain for shea and, and cocoa, but some of the parallels and, and overlaps between the two. Now, before I come to some concluding remarks, I just want to try and compare these two ways of globalization. And there are two key points I want to try and make. One is the continuity and the resilience of the local production systems managed by women. And I argue in the paper that this reflects the fact that women were very effective agents in responding to the change that was precipitated by extracting men from rural economies, which were essentially agrarian economies. And the shear butter provided a wonderful opportunity for women to be able to spread their labor demand throughout the year. Once you've harvested the shear nuts, the processing can be staggered as a function of the opportunity to sell your product in the periodic market system. You have a reliable source of income throughout the year. And in the absence of male labor, what alternatives do you have to continue extensive agricultural-based production systems? The creation of a new border between English and French colonies created a new resource it enabled women to exploit the opportunities because of price differentials in one country as opposed to another country. And what throughout the colonial period and the post-independence era, both colonial officials and in more contemporary Ghana, women have never been seen as interlocutors with the agencies or the colonial administration who have been trying to introduce new systems of production and new systems of incorporation into global economies. I found no records of attempts by any of the colonial administration and very few records in terms of the more recent attempts by the government of Ghana to actually engage with women Shia producers. They simply weren't a voice that was harnessed or listened to in terms of understanding. Similarly, by not doing, I argue in the paper that the social functions of periodic markets, not just their economic functions, were undervalued and underestimated. And they continue to be. And ultimately, I conclude there is this immutability of a marginalized locale. But this area of Northern Ghana, which was long forgotten and continues to be a backwater and still forgotten by the contemporary Ghanaian government, has its own ability to resist, to sustain itself by using new opportunities such as this poor trade. But the second key point is that in this period, once the cocoa butter equivalents emerged, we've started to see a progressive disintegration of, as I said earlier, a, in terms of written documentation, a 210-year history of a value chain in West Africa. And I suggest that it's actually linked to a much longer period of trade that goes beyond and before the expansion of Islam in that part of the world 700 years ago because it formed an integral part of the former trans-Saharan trade. That was controlled throughout that period by women. 
But what we're starting to see now is the emergence of middlemen who are bulking up, who are buying larger quantities to supply these three major players on a global scale. And this has been possible because of significant improvements in logistics, the transport communications, the outsourcing of low profit functions. We've seen this as some of these companies have now set up initial processing plants in West Africa rather than being in Denmark or Sweden where there are significant additional environmental costs of dealing with waste. And we've seen a regional organization of sourcing, the bulking up, building on the patterns of trade of periodic markets. And we've seen now the emergence of this persistent demand under the new EC regulations about the substitution of cocoa butter up to 5% in any chocolate, you can still call it chocolate. And to the best of my knowledge, it is only the French out of the 27 member states of Europe who have insisted on saying they will not comply with this. If it's chocolate, it has to have 100% cocoa butter. But leave la France, they have a new president, I don't know if that's going to change. Um, so there is this, this dichotomy of the continuity and resilience of local women producers at the same time as we're starting to see this, this integration. One of the fascinating things in the archives that I found was this very perspicacious observation that was written already in 1924 by Inspector Poole, who was a superintendent of the Agriculture and Forestry Department in the British Colonial Administration, who already wrote in 1924, and I quote, that the collecting of shear kernels is entirely done by women. But he anticipated then, this is, how many years is that now? 80, 90 years ago. But anticipated this would also, when it was found out there was money to be made from sheer cars. And this is exactly what is happening now. I don't have the figures for Ghana, but I do have comparable figures for Burkina Faso. This is a $20 million a year industry just for Burkina Faso. And I think it's significant larger in Ghana, but this is additional work I'm hoping to do. And then in terms of some of the conclusions and taking this forward, one of the concerns about the bulking up and the larger harvesting is whether in fact this may lead to a progressive erosion of the resource. And in my view, this is one of the key areas where we need to do additional research to actually have some more quantitative data on whether by harvesting larger quantities we're going to influence the natural regeneration of the shear butter partners or not. And here I've got some good news is we just reached more or less an agreement with CIHAD that we will be co-financing a new PhD in Burkina Faso on the political economy of the shear butter trade in that part of the world, but which will, we hope, include some more ecological research on the deterioration or risk deterioration of the resource base. In addition, there's some concern that's been raised by certain NGO groups in both Ghana and Burkina Faso about the risk this may place in terms of the substitution of shear butter as an edible oil with other oil equivalents, which don't have the same characteristics. It's uh, anecdotal, but shear butter oil is often regarded as the olive oil of the tropics. It has very similar characteristics to olive oil in terms of the, I can't, what is it, the, the fatty acids and the non-fatty acids. The, I, I, is there a specialist here? I, I'm, I'm suffering from the problems, but I can't remember what it is. <laughs> The, the ratios of uh, omega. Yeah, some omega uh, the diff different. The composition of the, the oil itself is very similar to olive oil, which is regarded as one of the best. There's clearly a reduction of the autonomy of women. Um, but equally, one of the distinguishing features of the historical patterns of trade of Shearna is that it distinguishes itself from many of the global markets by not exhibiting the classic boom and bust cycles that you've seen with cocoa and many other commodities which were driven by metropolitan interest. But again, one of the things I found fascinating was that the blindness that characterized the colonial government's understanding or lack of understanding about the Shia trade has actually continued post-independence Ghana in terms of understanding who are the key actors and its relative forms in the local and regional trade as distinct for the opportunities to generate foreign exchange. So I'll stop there and I hope you might have some questions or we can have a discussion. Thanks very much for your patience. Thank you.